I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and hotties. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, too. And, and I've got a riddle today. Another one? Mm-hmm, another one. You think I'll fool you with it? So the only way to find out is to ask me. <laughs> Here it is. Why does a dog turn around three times before lying down? Mm, to make sure his tail is wound around his nose to get the flies off. <laughs> no. Am I warm? No, not a bit warm. All right, I give up. Why does a dog turn around three times before lying down? Because one good turn deserves another. <laughs> oh, so that's why a dog keeps turning around and around and around and around. That's a very funny riddle, that is. <laughs> I thought you'd like it. <laughs> I certainly do. No, I'd like it if you'd read me the funny. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do... Let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, Big Ben Bolt. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Faint and punch and dodge and twist. It's a knockout blow from Big Ben's fist. Big Ben Bolt, a famous boxer, is on a trip around the country challenging the local favorite in towns along the way. He's offered $1,000 to any boxer that can beat him. In a western city, he finds himself in the ring with an Indian named Chief Tallpine, who has been fighting unfairly. And just as everything seems to be going against Ben, an old Indian chief stepped out from the crowd and stopped the fight. He's ordered Chief Tallpine to fight Ben fair and square, Indian style. Today, the gloves are taken off the two fighters, and the slippery grease has been wiped from the body of the Indian. Chief Tallpine says to Ben, Okay, Bolt. My honored grandfather says we've got to finish this scrap Indian style. Ever fight Indian style, pal? Why, no. Spider, Ben's trainer, says to Ben, Hey, let's slip this tomahawk. He bears a thousand bucks for staying three rounds and get out of here. At least what I scamps, huh, kid? No, Spider, we fight. Last picture top row, Ben and Chief Tallpine square off. Face each other with bare hands. Chief Tallpine circles Ben. And seeing that Ben isn't used to this style of fighting, says... Ah, uh, you're confused, eh, Bolt? <laughs> it's simple. All you have to do is try and stop me from rubbing your face into a solid foot of mud and gravel. First picture bottom row, the Chief lunges at Ben. Ben knows that once the Chief gets his arms around him, he's through. And he cocks his right in a desperate effort. <laughs> and Chief Tallpine drops unconscious to the ground, knocked out cold. The old Indian chief holds up his hand and says to Ben, If you were of my tribe, I should call you he who cast hand like bolt of lightning. The issue is settled, my people. Go to your homes in peace. Spider says to Ben, Yeah, and let us not tarry neither, huh, Ben? Last picture, a short time later, Ben and Spider get in their car, ready to continue on their tour. Both are wearing an Indian's headdress, which was given them by the old chief, who has admired Ben's way of fighting fair. As they start off, Spider says, Hi, Ben, when can we dump these turkey helmets? Ben waves goodbye to the old chief, who's waving to them. Well, not until we get out of town, Spider. The old chief's waving at us now. And off they drive to a new adventure. Chief Tallpine out? Yes, it was. And it was wonderful, too, that that old Indian chief made Chief Tallpine fight fair. Yes. And he likes Ben because Ben is honest and brave and true. Yes. Well, I wonder what happens to Ben next. Well, you'll be here, and I'm sure you'll find another interesting adventure. Now? Oh, now I know it's time for Prince Valiant. And I know you're right, so let's turn over the page to page three. All right. And here he 
Yes, on page three. And you remember that Prince Valiant was trying to capture the castle of a mean, bad, cruel tyrant named Sigurd Hola. That's right. The castle was on a high hill, and it was impossible for the small group of knights with Val to capture it in a fight. So Val had a wonderful idea, and he got the people who were in the countryside who hated Sigurd Holm because he treated them like slaves. Well, he got these people to dig a tunnel so that the water flooded underneath a special part of the castle. Yes, Val directed the river so it would flow underneath a part of the hill the castle was built upon. And last week, part of the hill began to slide away, and I wonder if the castle castle will fall down on the head of Sigurd Holm and his men, I hope. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Brackett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> On the castle wall, Sigurd Holm, who was defying Val and his twenty men, shouts insults to Val, who stands at the foot of the hill. And then suddenly, the wall sways and cracks beneath his hand. Last picture top row. As the dust settles, Val draws the singing sword and enters the ruins. He has some unfinished business with Sigurd Holm, but before he can move, there comes another ominous sound. The tower seems to be moving slowly. It sways, and then... The sound swells into a terrifying roar as the whole fortress melts into the crowd of dust. The castle of Sigurd Holm has fallen in ruin. It looked like he was standing right where the castle fell. And the, and the whole castle's fallen down now, hasn't it? Yes, it looks as though it has. Although there might be a section up on the hill behind the tower that still stands. Oh, oh I hope Sigurd Holm didn't run back and hide in that because then Val would have some more trouble with him. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now? Now is it time for Robin Hood now? Well, yet? let's turn over the page and see. All right. Oh, look, there's Robin Hood right now. Yes, see? there's Robin Hood. And you remember, last week, Robin Hood was walking through the forest with his father, and his father was killed by an arrow that was fired by Red Gill, and he was one of the men of the mean sheriff of Nottingham. Yes, and then Robin saw that Red Gill was trying to kill him, too. So in self-defense, Robin shot Red Gill. And then some of the others of the sheriff's men came riding through the forest, and, and they saw that Robin Hood had killed Red Gill, and so they started to chase Robin Hood. And now, I wonder what will happen to him. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! Robin Hood doesn't dare show his face in any of the cities or towns for fear of being arrested by the sheriff and his men. But word of what has happened to Robin and his father spreads around the countryside. There are those who are sympathetic to Robin and hate the sheriff and his rough men. And soon, other brave lads join Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest to resist the ruthless new sheriff. One day, one of the sheriff's men is stacking up a sign in town. A sign which offers a reward for Robin's capture. One of Robin's friends, named Alan Adale, strolls through the crowd and sings a little song to tease the sheriff's men. Oh, Robin Hood doth hunt the deer that in the woodlands prance, but oft time shoots the sheriff's men by sorrowful mischance. The sheriff's man turns and snarls, This sentence of outlawry will hang your Robin Hood minstrel. There's forty marks on his head. Alan answers, He robs the rich to help the poor, a most unusual practice. And now that Robin's been outlawed, he needn't pay his taxes. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sheriff and his bowmen brutally enforce the new tax laws. The people are so poor from paying taxes that some are forced to go hunting for food. At last picture top row, several poor men are captured for shooting the king's deer in the forest. And one of the men says to the sheriff, De Lacey, I had no meat. Your men have taxed me out of house and home. First picture, bottom row, De Lacey says, You know the whereabouts of the outlaw Robin Hood. Lead us to him, and our reward will pay your taxes thrice over. The man answers, I'll not betray Robin Hood. No, no, I, no, I. Angrily, the sheriff shouts, Bring them in. 
We'll make a public example of them in Nottingham Square. As they move off through the forest, last picture, a strangely hooded figure watches as the poor men are cruelly forced to follow the stern figure of the sheriff. Oh, I, I just hate that mean De Lacey because he makes those people so poor they can't even eat. Yes, he takes all their money with his taxes. Well, no wonder they have to hunt so they can get some food. Yes, no wonder. Oh, even though the sheriff is cruel to them, though, they're loyal to Robin Hood. And that's because they know that Robin Hood is a good man. I wonder who that strange figure is, though, who's watching. Well, next week, I'm sure we'll find out. Now, let's turn over the page, though, and see who's there. Oh, look, it's Donald Duck, my favorite, favorite. And we won't waste a minute. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze jump, squeeze jump, squeeze the chicka chat. Let's have music to better quack, quack. Little Dewey, Donald's nephew, is having an argument with a tough boy of the neighborhood who's poking his finger at Dewey's chest and yelling, Your uncle's the biggest chiseler in town. And Dewey yells back, He's the littlest chiseler. Your pop's the biggest. Okay, my pop is big, but your uncle is bigger. Okay, prove it. Oh, you want proof, eh? Yeah. Last picture, top row of the tough little kid socks Dewey in the eye. Okay, there it is. First picture, bottom row. Dewey sits on the ground holding his sore eye. The tough guy starts to walk off. Dewey yells, Uh-huh, the hit and run type, huh? And he leaps to his feet and runs after the little tough guy. He grabs him by the shoulders. Uh-huh, I got gotcha. you. The tough guy turns around and winds up. And then... Last picture, the door opens, and into the house comes Dewey. Donald, who doesn't see that both Dewey's eyes are black, says cheerfully, Hi, Dewey. Dewey slams the door and snaps. Hi, Uncle Chiseler. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Dewey was sticking up for his Uncle Donald because that tough boy called Donald a chiseler. And now Dewey is in so much pain, he's not going to fight any longer. So he gives up and says, Uncle Donald is a chiseler. <laughs> oh, that Donald is so funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I know where to find them. The first page of the second section. All right, you find the page, and I'll read Dagwood and Blondie in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> A salesman for kinky can openers is talking to one of the ladies on Dagwood Street. Well, madam, I'm selling a new type of can opener. Oh, just what I need. I'll take one. Oh. Thank you, madam. And he walks down the street saying, I love my job. Oh, what a joy it is to deal with these pretty little housewives. They're so sweet and kind. By the time you can get to the last picture, top row, he's showing his can openers to another lady, and she's saying, Oh, how nice. Yes, I'll take one. Oh, thank you, madam. And down the street he goes again. First picture, second row, he says happily, Oh, the women look so cute with little bows in their hair and wearing pretty little aprons. And then he walks up to the Bumstead's house. Yes, sir. I wouldn't trade jobs with the king. I'm happy with my work. He rings the bell. Inside the house, Dagwood, who is painting a table, last picture, second row, exclaims, Oh, now what? He opens the door, sees the salesman standing there. I'm selling. No, I don't want any. But the salesman tries to show Dagwood his can openers anyway. Well, we have two kinds. Uh, whereupon Dagwood socks the salesman. And I say no, don't like that. And they get into a big fight. I can't help it. Will you get away? Go away, will you? you pop. Dagwood tries to run to the house. But I say, he slams the door shut, and the salesman sticks his leg through the door. Then he shouts through the partly open door. Uh, they come in two sizes. Dagwood sees the salesman's leg sticking through the door, and he gets a diabolical idea. He looks at his paint pot, then the salesman's foot. And then he grins. I'll prove man's superiority over salesman. He jerks off the salesman's shoe. His sock. 
and then takes his paintbrush, first picture, bottom row, and starts to paint the salesman's foot. Oh, oh, stop, stop! A devilish look comes over Dagwood's face, and he says, I hate myself when I get these fiendish ideas. The salesman feels the wet paint on the end of his toes. Stop it, stop it, stop it! And then the brush tickles the bottom of his foot. And then he feels the paint all over his foot. Oh, no, 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 no. Stop it, stop it, stop it. And then Dagwood opens the door. The salesman looks at his foot and sees it covered with paint. No, green. Last picture. The salesman comes into the kinky can opener company, wearing one shoe and one foot covered with green paint. He holds up his green foot and he says to the manager, I'm resigning. I'm going into some business where husbands aren't allowed. <laughs> Isn't that funny? When the salesman wouldn't go away and he stuck his foot in the door and Dagwood painted his foot green. And broke the salesman's pretty red heart. Oh, that's funny. He painted his foot green and broke his pretty red heart. It was a good way to get rid of him, though, wasn't it? Yes, the funniest things happen to Dagwood and Blondie. They do, they do, they do, they do. Well, now look at the bottom of the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, read that, please. Very well. In the bottom of the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Ah, yip yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Ah, yip yo <laughs> Lawyer Carstairs and a young toughie named Shanks have been trying to steal the Box K Ranch from Teddy Knox, whose father has just died. When Roy had intervened and prevented them from forcing Teddy to sign and turn the ranch over to them, Carstairs and Shanks went to meet the stagecoach that was bringing in a buyer for the ranch. A man by the name of Lowry. Lowry turned out to be a beautiful girl who had come to buy the ranch in answer to a letter from Carstairs. Carstairs wants her to sign the bill of sale at once and give him the money. But the girl insists on seeing the ranch. Third picture, top row, Shank snarls. Sorry, sister, but I can't waste time. You got the papers to my ranch, so I'm taking the money now. She slips out of the saddle. Quickly, Carstairs and Shanks mount the two horses. Last picture, top row. Carstairs exclaims, Great Scott, Shanks, that funnel-shaped cloud looks like a tornado. Yeah, it is. Come on, let's head for Crooked Cave. And they ride off, leaving the girl standing alone on the prairie. Wait, you can't leave me here alone. First picture, bottom row, at the Box K Ranch. Roy sees the approaching tornado and exclaims, Hey, Corny! If that tornado rips through here, if Teddy Knox's ranch is as lost as if Carstairs and Shanks stole it like they planned. Make for the cyclone cellar! Oh, Teddy and Corny run for the underground cyclone cellar and safety. Roy, seeing the girl in the knoll, runs for Trigger. Hey, there's somebody up on that knoll. I'm going up there. All right, come on, Trigger. Come on. Hit him. Hey. Faster, Trigger. Faster. The tornado's gaining on us. Roy gallops up to the girl, pulls her up on the saddle beside him, and sees the tornado was overtaking them. And we can't make it back to the ranch, Miss. We've got to find shelter before that twister hits. There's a cave near here. It's that way. And Roy heads trigger for the cave and safety. Ooh, that's the cave where Shanks and Carstairs are. I believe it is. When if they get into that cave, Roy can get the girl's money back. Yes, and he may ride right into the end of Shanks' gun. Oh, oh I never thought of that. Oh, I wonder which it'll be. Well, we'll find out next week. Now let's go over the page, and look, there's Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, there's Flash Gordon. And this is so exciting because Flash is captured by a man named Pyron who has a plan to capture the whole world. Yes, Pyron has mastered the secret of controlling a comet, a huge star, and he's speeding the comet faster and faster at Earth, hoping to destroy the Earth. And last week, Flash tried to escape from the room where they were kept prisoner, and those scaly little men caught him, and they were going to throw him overboard into the flames on the outside of the comet. My, I, I wonder if what'll happen to Flash now. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. A rega rega doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. The ugly little comet men are about to throw Flash into the flames of the comet. But Clama, Pyron's assistant, tells them to bring Flash to Pyron instead. Reluctantly obeying Clama's command... The Comet men abandon their plan to hurl Flash overboard from the insulated space sphere. Moving close to Flash, the girl whispers, I'll go to Pyron. I'll try to persuade him to spare you. Do not lose heart. 
A few minutes later, pursuing her devious scheme, the wily Flama hastens to Pyron. She tells him he must listen to her, that there is nothing to be gained by killing the Earthman. And she tells him she's positive she'll be able to draw from Flash the information Pyron needs about the Earth's plans and weapons for opposing Pyron's comet power. Pyron nods his head in agreement. Last picture, top row, Flash is brought to Pyron. Pyron falls in with Flama's plan and boastfully displays to Flash the cosmic power controls that are steering the blazing comet toward a fiery collision with the Earth. While Pyron struts, Flash maps his strategy. As the comet man turns toward the machinery, Flash sees his chance. First picture, bottom row, whirling on the unsuspecting guard, Flash snatches his flame gun. But the scaly little comet man struggles fiercely, and a few seconds of delay give Pyron time to whirl around and bring his own gun into play. A heavy beam of short-range cosmic rays spurts from Pyron's weapon and strikes Flash with stunning impact. As Flash falls unconscious, the guard leaps forward and disarms him. And last picture, as Flash is dragged away, Flama proceeds with her treacherous plan aimed at wresting control of the comet from Pyron. Realizing Flash's value as an ally, she pleads with Pyron to spare him and says slyly, Let him live. He'll be valuable as a hostage. Oh, wasn't that terrible that Flash didn't get that gun quickly enough? Yes, that was his big chance to overcome Pyron and control the comet itself. You think that Flama will be able to stop Pyron from having Flash killed? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. As long as Flash is alive, there's hope. Yes, but he certainly doesn't have much chance surrounded by these people. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now... Now is the time for Dick's adventure. It certainly is. So let's turn to the very last page of Puck the Comic Weekly. Oh, and there he is on the last page. And you remember last week that Dick had been helping Chief Tecumseh. That's uh, an Indian chief he was. Yes, yes. Dick had found Tecumseh wounded in the wilderness and was taking him to a doctor at a fort down the river. And then, as they were standing at the edge of the river, watching some American soldiers who were coming in the distance, all of a sudden, some Indians came out of the forest where they were and surrounded Dick and Tecumseh. Yes, they were Tecumseh's friends, and among them was a white trapper. I wonder what'll happen to them now. Let's read and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick stands among the Indians who surround him and Tecumseh. He sees the white trapper among them, and he notices that the white trapper is a British courier spy. Dick knows that in the courier's pouch there must be important messages. Suddenly, Dick leaps for the pouch. Hey, what says you? He gets it and starts to run away. Last picture, top row. Stop him! Stop him! Next picture, he's seized by the husky Indians, and the pouch is snatched back by the Britisher. You young whippersnapper. Last picture, second row. Another Indian rushes up with a warning that a strong column of American soldiers is drawing near. Dick is quickly muzzled, first picture bottom row, so he can't warn the soldiers. And he and the Indians lie silently hidden as the Americans march by. Hours later, when the last Yankee soldier has passed, Dick is tied to a tree and left in the wilderness alone as the Indians, led by Tecumseh, go away. And as Dick stands in the wilderness alone... Tied to the tree, he thinks that Tecumseh, whose life he saved days ago, has now treacherously arranged to have Dick's silence permanent. For last picture, two wolves come out of the forest and move slowly toward Dick. Oh, isn't that terrible? Dick is tied to the tree and he can't move, and, and here come the wolves. Well, they can kill him dead. Yes, and to think that Dick was so close to the American soldiers and couldn't say a word to them. Oh, that Tecumseh. I wonder if he means to leave Dick there by himself, because that's ungrateful, because Dick could save Tecumseh's life. You're right, it is ungrateful. Yes. But well, we'll find out what happens next week. Now, look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And, and you remember that Coast Guard officer arrested that Blackie Kirk, and now Rusty and Tex and Peter are safe again. I wonder what they'll do now. They're, they're still a long way from home. Well, let's find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Tex, Pete, and Rusty, and the horses are at a little farm a short distance away from where the old freighter had been run aground by the two crooks, Blackie and Captain Crump. Tex is saying to the boys, Yep, it's hard to believe. 
But Blackie Kirk and Captain plan to wreck that old freighter from the very start just to collect the insurance on these horses. They had him insured for an enormous amount. Rusty says, So that's why they didn't want the radio man to send an SOS. Pete asks, Well, what do we do now, Tex? Tex replies, Well, I phoned Mr. Miles. Oh, he's funny burned up. But he told me to wait on this farm till he talks to Colorado Colby. Rusty says, Well, Clem says that the Coast Guard won't let that ship go until there's some kind of an investigation. So the horses will have to be shipped some other way. After a conversation with Colorado Colby, Mr. Miles learns that a dealer about 10 miles from where Tex and the horses are will buy the horses, but he can't take them for about a week. Mr. Miles relays this information to Tex. And a little later at the farmhouse, Tex is saying to the lady of the house, second picture, bottom row, uh, my boss, Mr. Miles, phone. Mrs. Jones wants to know if we can stay on here with the horses for a week. You pay you well. What do you say? A man who is in the house of Mrs. Jones snaps, I'll answer to that, mister. Excuse me, but uh, who might you be, sir? Me? My name's Marlow. And Mrs. Jones does what I tell her, I advise her to do. And I'm advising her to let you pasture those horses just one week. And no longer. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the far end of the pasture, last picture, Rusty and Pete have been wandering about the farm near an old shack. Pete says, Hey, 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 hold it a second, Rusty. I thought I heard somebody crying. Rusty answers, and So did I, Pete. He sounded like a kid. And I think it came from that shack. Oh, I wonder if that crying could mean that something new and exciting is going to happen. Well, you never know. And, and I don't like the way that, that Milo spoke to Tex. He asks as if he wants him to get away from there. It does look like that. And it all adds up to something mysterious, doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe we'll find out more about it next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.